Hi there, my name is Tony Visco and I'm your host. I want to take a few seconds to say hello and welcome you to the show. We're going to call this show The Artist's World. It's my pleasure on behalf of myself and my guest, David Buckman of the Golden Gull Studio, uh, to, uh, to welcome you and, uh, and uh, to the show. And at this point, I know this is going to be an absolute game changer for a lot of people in the art business. We hope to bring you uh, clear and decisive information in regard to different aspects of w the art world and why you should be doing things. David is a, uh, is a framer and proprietor of uh, the Golden Gull Studio along with his wife, Frema, and, uh, and the Golden Gull Studio is here in, Mass in uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts. David, I thought I'd pose a couple of questions that I put together and hopefully we can get a dialogue going with, in regard to why framing is so important. Uh, to artists and, uh, and what it really does to the painting. Um, there's some thoughts, if I can start off this way, if there's some thoughts with regard to people like myself, painters, artists, uh, why we really need professional framing for our, our work. Um, you know, thoughts run a lot to sometimes, for us it's too expensive perhaps maybe, or why can't we really do it ourselves? So what I'd like you to do, if you don't mind, is to uh, address some of the issues as to why we as artists need professional framers. Well, that's a deep question. <laughs> I could talk about is that for at least uh, you know three days. No, no. Uh, I have been uh, a custom picture framer for 39 years now and have enjoyed every day of my profession. Work is still play, even though work is very serious and very exacting. Let me say that, Tony, my expertise begins where your expertise ends. Oh, that's nice to know. Your concern from here to here, what is created by your artwork. My expertise begins at the edge what do we do to complete the statement? What do we do to get it on the wall so that it is stable, strong enough, aesthetically pleasing, and hopefully reasonably priced given the fact that the materials we use are not inexpensive materials? Yeah, I understand that. Actually, you, in a, you sort of summed up a lot of the questions that I had in that statement. That Are you, we done? You made. <laughs> so we can almost walk out of here right now. But let's take it a little further. Sure. Uh, uh, question by question, can you explain, for instance, the difference between using economy paper mats versus rag mats? Or why somebody should use a buffered versus a non-buffered uh, uh, Matt, uh, what, what is matting all about in terms of... Oh. Okay, matting provides three things. It provides a resting point for your eye between the artwork and the outer frame. It provides a vapor barrier, so it gives you that little separation between the artwork and the glass so that you don't have to worry about humidity. And the third thing, which is what most everybody thinks about, is the aesthetic quality of the mat. Is the tint or the shade enough to complement the piece, or is it overpowering the piece? So we have to be concerned with balance. <clears throat> In terms of paper, let me give you a short history of paper. Okay, papyrus is where it came from back in the days of old Egypt with hieroglyphics, so on and so forth. Very few people had access to paper. The nobility were the only ones that had access to paper. Paper was made out of rag. Rag were cotton linters. Well, what in the world are cotton linters? Every time you empty your dryer, 
uh, uh, yeah. your washing machine sure. dryer, sure. you get this pile of lint, yeah. okay? Those are linters, okay? And if it happens to be from cotton, they're 100% what we call rag, okay? And that is the basis for which stable paper has been made for hundreds of years. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the only people who had the financial horsepower to yeah. afford paper were the nobility and the wealthy, yeah. and that was it, and the church. And so written material on paper, that was the only way to do it, okay, or on parchment, mm -hmm. was limited to that upper, upper uh, echelon of, of human yeah, beings right. or to the uh, ecclesiastical uh, sector of the population. Along comes the Industrial Revolution, and there is a tremendous need for something that is cheaper, easier to manufacture, and there's a whole supply of it. And so wood pulp supplanted uh, paper, uh, uh, rag. supplanted rag. rag sure. Now, wood pulp is a wonderful substance. The only thing is that you need something to stiffen it. And the stiffener in it is alum, A-L-U-M. Sure. Alum is great stuff for stiffening paper. And the, the poorer the quality of paper, the greater amount of alum. You're right. But alum, in the presence of oxygen and in a stale environment, stagnant environment, begins to have a chemical change. As a matter of fact, if you buy a newspaper, which is very, very high quality paper, as you know, yeah. newsprint is about the lowest quality yeah. paper right. you can get, right. um, leave it out in the sun for a day and you'll see that it'll turn yellow. Leave it out in the sun for a week and you'll see brown. And then eventually, you'll see it look like it was singed with a match. Mm -hmm. And That's what right. has happened is the alum in, in the air mass has turned to sulfuric acid and has burned the actual sure. paper. Sure. Okay, so this was the stuff, uh, most of the books in the libraries are printed on wood pulp paper. Right. Yeah. Okay, and it is only, only maybe in the last 60, 70 years that uh, uh, curators and librarians have discovered, hey, our collection is disappearing before our eyes. What can we do to arrest this process or reverse this process? <coughs> Excuse me, folks. Um, and finally, finally, um, there was something that could be used as a buffer, and it was called calcium carbonate. It's chalk. Yeah. It's very, very inert. And that could be added to wood pulp to kind of stabilize sl it, stabilize it sure, slow course. it down. However, the fine art market in the 1970s had maybe three colors of rag mat available for consumption, mm -hmm. same as they had maybe in the 1890s. Yeah. They had white, off-white, and cream mats. That was it. How did you embellish a mat back then when you only had three colors? Well, we could put lines on the mat with a ruling pen. Those were called French lines. Mm -hmm. We could put marbleized paper around it mm -hmm. to embellish and enhance the mat. By putting marbleized paper, you mean gluing some paper on there? Gluing some paper on, okay. exactly. And that sufficed until the 1970s. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, the market, the, the market began to uh, ask for more. Sure. And so the two, uh, three biggest mat board companies in the country, uh, Bainbridge, Rising, and Crescent Cardboard, began to develop different colors of 100% 100 cotton rag mats. Mm -hmm. And they also developed a line of calcium carbonate uh, impregnated mats okay. to, to um, 
supplant the market. We then had eight colors. Then we went to 12. God forbid, 12 colors. You know, you the choices. Choice. <laughs> this was like when, if you remember in the 70s, when there was finally colored toilet paper, yeah. and you didn't know which color to buy and stuff. The cost was still exorbitant. Yeah. Mm. Framing materials will never be cheap, okay? It's just a matter the way of fact. Yep. But these three mat board companies also produce a student grade wood pulp mat board, mm -hmm. okay? What we call regular mat board, mm -hmm. something you will not find in my store and have not found in my store since I bought it in 1982. I refuse to carry that low grade. There's a threshold below which I will not go. Mm -hmm. Everything that I frame is up to a preservation standard and what they call museum, museum framing, mm -hmm. okay? And this is the standard on, upon which I built my business, but it's pretty much where every frame shop has built their business. So if I hear you correctly, what you really, what an artist should be looking at when they talk to a framer, whether it's yourself or somebody else, is whether or not they will use inferior materials. And you pretty much want to stay away from inferior materials because it, it degradates the, the piece itself. If you're going to frame a decent piece, watercolor for instance, and you put on an acid, what I call an acid-free mat, uh, you're much better off having the integrity of that piece stay with you as opposed to putting on something that's going to be leach acid into the painting and then feed it in. And then you start getting all these brown marks and everything else on the painting itself. Eventually. Right. And what, what happens with a regular mat, and we see it so often in, in our store, and also you'll see it probably in, in, in your own house if you look closely at where the incision was made for the window of the mat. Mm -hmm. If it's beginning to turn brown on you and look a little rusty, guess what that yeah, is? Yeah, yeah. That yeah. is the alum in those mat boards. Sure. And it will eventually transfer and put a burn line on whatever artwork you're trying to frame. What? It will also burn a hole in whatever you're trying to frame, given enough time and the right amount of humidity, light, heat, cold, temperature change, condensation, you name it. My goodness. Um, you know, blow, blow a water pipe in your house and you've got a tremendous amount of humidity during the winter right. when, and uh, all of a sudden, and, uh, and things begin to happen. Well, it, that's good to know because as an artist, you know, we don't think about things beyond the canvas. Whether or not we're doing oils, acrylics, or we're getting into watercolor where we need to frame it a little differently. So from my perspective, it's very good to know that we should be thinking about that. Now, whether we choose to do it ourselves or we go to a professional framer, if we're going to do it ourselves, we should be cognizant of quality material when we even do it ourselves. Right. So it's very good, it's very good to know that, that there's a concern about good matting, good materials. Right, and, and, and not only that, um, why should someone go to a professional framer? Why shouldn't they, first of all, you can't get most products that you need at Home Depot or at Lowe's or at Walmart. Mm -hmm. You can't just go out and find s selections of, of, of length molding. And then you need the machinery to cut it and cut it well. And then you need the machinery to join it. And you need to know, is this wood strong enough and dense enough to carry the weight of the glass that you're going to put on it? Well, speaking of glass, let's talk a little bit about glass because you're going from, from the wood material, which we will get into, but I'm very concerned about glass when you're framing, say, a watercolor in that there's a, very, there's a lot of differences between the glass that are, that are on the market. In today's technology, we've, uh, we've over the years, like, your, like Matt's, got a lot better and more proficient at, at quality glass, uh, UVs especially, protective glass that, that keeps uh, the sun from uh, overexposing a piece and, and fading, <coughs> fading it out. So maybe we can talk a little bit about um, glass, for instance, versus good glasses versus ac also ac acrylics and, and whether or not you want to glaze with glass or whether or not you want to use a plexiglass. 
I know in, from the New England, a lot, of, a lot of societies, a lot of art societies don't like to handle glass, so they ask us to frame using an acrylic in order to, uh, so that there won't be any breakage when we ship. So right. probably it would be a good idea very quickly to address maybe some of the pros and cons of glass and, and acrylics and where we go with that. Let me say first about acrylic glazing, plexiglass, if right, you will, exactly. but the, only one company, Rome and Haas, can use the actual term plexiglass. Every other manufacturer has to use acrylic glazing right. because they own the they own rights the to that. Sure, of course. You know, up until maybe 25 years ago, if you wanted high ultraviolet uh, filtration in your glazing to keep things keep your artwork from fading away. The only, the only way you could do it was with plexiglass that had the highest UV filtration. And it was somewhere in the mid-60s, mm -hmm. a 60 percent, 60th percentile, to uh, if you really paid for very, very high quality, you could get up to about uh, 80, 80 percent. Whereas glass, was 45% to 55%, uh, depending upon whether it was non-glare glass or clear glass. And non-glare glass is basically acid-etched glass on one side. The cheap glass that's non-glare that's available in discount houses is acid-etched on both sides. You can't see through it. It's the worst stuff in the world. And you can actually feel the facets in the glass when you run your hands down it. Our glass, non-glare, uh, you can't feel anything. It feels as smooth as, uh, as, as a sheet of regular glass. Mm -hmm. But you will not find uh, conservation grade glass or UV or conservation clear glass, uh, you know, in hardware stores. They're doing window glass of course. and door glass. They're, they're not concerned about that. You probably won't find it at glass specialty places. They're into shower doors and, and things like that. <coughs> Again, pardon me. We are very concerned with what we do. We don't care if it's a child's finger painting or it's an original, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar piece of artwork. Mm -hmm. If we're going to glaze it, we're going to put ninety nine percent UV glass on it. And I happen to have it in three grades. I have it in clear, so it looks like regular glass. Mm -hmm. I have it in non-glare, and then I, we also came out with something, well, this was basically developed in the middle 80s, uh, something called 2020 glass was the first non-reflective clear glass. It didn't even look like glass. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Bainbridge Matte Board came out with it, uh, but when the economy collapsed at the end of the 80s, uh, that went away. Mm -hmm. The other problem with that glass was uh, it was very brittle glass. It could shatter on you in a moment. Uh, it was dangerous. unbelievable. You could tap it like this and all of a sudden it would, you would have nothing. Destroy the piece. It, it, yes, yes. <laughs> you know? And don't ask me how I have that knowledge. I still own that print, you know, with shards in it. Um, and, uh, not a good thought. Not a good thought at all. Wow. Uh, but but uh, Chicago Dial Glass Company, which later became TrueView, yeah. um, came out with conservation clear glass, oh, probably in the late 90s. And we immediately got rid of every sheet, every pane of, of uh, regular glass that we had in the store and supplanted it with this. Yes, it costs a little bit more. But well, boy, it's great stuff. Well, that's very interesting because you're really dealing with, uh, if you de from my perspective, if you're dealing with an artist who always looks, is always looking for the best value they can get. Now, sometimes I use the word value, but some people are just, I mean, I've, we've seen it in the past where people will go out to yard sales and get some old, old painting uh, that's there, take the frame off, take the glass off, clean it up, put their piece in and so forth. Uh, sometimes a dangerous practice, but I can understand the mentality of most people that are, are painting, especially if you're not uh, well along in the work and maybe you're not selling as many pieces as you'd like to sell and so forth and you're just starting out. Maybe a, 
it, it's, it's a problem for a lot of artists to come to a professional framer and say, David, we need to frame this piece. Can you help me out? And can you give me a good value? Which brings me to the point of pricing. My God, if, you, if I walk into you as an artist and just theoretically sit down and say, can you help me with this thing? And you say, well, you, know, you can do it A, you can do it B, or you can do it C. Uh, the best way that we think you should do it is C. But doesn't that always suggest higher prices in terms of the artist and what they have to go through and whether or not that piece itself is now the artist now puts enough value in that piece to be able to frame it in its proper perspective, in its proper manner. Because price is always a concern for most of us that are out in the market. We, we know listen, that. Listen, <laughs> I've been dealing with price for 39 years. Um, artists are concerned with getting their product to market the fastest the easiest on the wallet and if they can get it done for less money someplace else they will go there I have no problem with that I have no problem with that I like to help out artists in any way that I can um, there are different gradations of mat costs within the conservation category, mm -hmm. okay? You don't need to use a suede mat, which costs four times as much as a plain rag mat. You may not need a textured mat. Mm -hmm. Which costs probably which, more money. Which costs about 30% more. You may not need a metallic conservation mat, which costs about 50% more. So there are baselines from which we can start uh, and, and we move from there. And the other thing is that, well, I carry about 1,500 different types of moldings on my wall, on my sample wall. I don't stock every one of them. I stock about one mile of molding, mm -hmm. okay? Um, molding from different manufacturers has different costs. Some moldings, just like in the fashion industry, are knockoffs of other companies' moldings. Mm -hmm. And so they become more economical. Can you buy the generic frame? Is it a good substantial wood? Is the finish as good? Is the cutability, if there's such a word, as good. In other words, when I run it through Piecing my the when Piecing I run it through it. my ten thousand dollar saw, right. is it going to give me a clean forty five degree miter without chips? Right. Um, well, let, let me just bring up a real quick point because we're going to have to wrap this up pretty soon. We could really talk about this literally forever. I mean, we've got a great subject matter here, and probably we can do some additional shows on this. Uh, I'd be and glad I'm going to come the, back. And I'm actually going to let the people out there. I would like to know what you want us to talk about. So please be, be good enough to either contact the studio or you can always get a hold of me at, the art, at Tony V, T-O-N-Y-V, at theartdude.com. And let me know what you want to hear. But this is an, a fascinating subject. And my gut feeling is, is that we're dealing with two different things, two different philosophies here. What the ultimate buyer wants as a, in terms of, of matting and framing and what the artist is willing to pay. The only thing I want you to tell me right now, David, is is it worth me, so that we can wrap it, is it worth it for me to go to these, quote, specialty companies that have 50, 60, 70, 80 percent off, or should we go to a legitimate framer? That I, I say a legitimate framer, I'm saying small mom and pop frame operations that are really keyed, professional people that are, uh, are in the industry uh, because we all hear, hey, come on down to XYZ company and we're happy to give you 50% off or 80% off and we'll take good care of you. Just answer that. Can you, can you address something like that? There isn't a business that can stay afloat selling at 50% off. They have to raise their price up higher so that they can give you that 50% off. 
I cannot recount how many, not dozens, but high hundreds of times I have had customers come into our store who have had work done at these large stores that advertise 40, 50, 60, 80 percent off and they've paid more than they would have paid with me not even on sale. Well, that sounds and so, and th that's the first thing. The second thing is a lot of these great big shops don't even do the work in-house. They're order takers. Mm. The difference between them and my type of business, and I'm not saying just Golden Gull, I'm talking about custom framers custom in frame general. Right. The person that takes your order is the person that usually does the work on your order, performs the actual custom framing, and may also be the same person that presents you with the finished product. You know, and let me tell you, that's a wonderful thing. Well, that's customer service. You give birth. That's, that's customer service, yeah. and I think that we all need to concern ourselves or consider that when we want to do a finished piece that we want framed well. Yeah. I want to, I, first of all, thank you for coming in. I appreciate this. My I'd, pleasure. I'd, like to, I'd really like to talk a little bit more about this. I also would like to talk on another show about getting involved in the, the actual, what you actually do in the process of fr framing a piece, because that, would, that in itself would be a, a great show to do. We um, could, I'd love to talk to you about how we designed something. That's the other area. I mean, I have right now probably, as you can see, I'm working off of a list. I have 20 questions, and unfortunately, we have a short period of time in which to get in to these questions. As you can see, David has been very good about uh, talking about uh, the process and some of the things that you guys need to know when you go and you frame a piece. But we really are only touching the surface right now. Again, important to consider quality framing by a quality framer. And uh, let's talk again in the future as we keep going. Uh, we'll do another show on this and set something up so that we can, we'll have a continuation of, of, of this so that you guys can learn a little bit more about what you need to know. Uh, David, I want to thank you for coming in. I can't tell you enough. I mean, I've been down to your shop. We've worked together in the past. You uh, and I have known each other for 34 other years. For, for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and it's, again, I mean, you've, you've hung my work and you're, you're, there's a whole other area we're going to talk about at some point in time. What it, what it takes to actually sell this stuff, because if anybody knows, David Hang's uh, original works, he's got a nice shop down at the Golden Gull here in Plymouth. You ought to go in and say hello to him. Uh, you're going to see some nice stuff that's on the wall. Uh, and uh, he'll talk a little bit more about uh, framing with you at any time you want it, want it. I mean, he's a wealth of information. So keep that in mind as you go forward. Um, Come in. I was vaccinated with a phonograph. Yeah, no, we it, can talk. The, 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 this conversation is a little bit. Uh, this conversation is a little bit tough because he's he was willing to come in even though he's not feeling well today. So we'll pick it up at, in the future. And I want to thank you all for uh, for being with me and sharing this delightful uh, conversation. Uh, and hopefully it was casual enough for you guys to pick up and, and enjoy. Thanks for for being with us today. Hildun Hall Museum is a treasure house of our deepest American history with objects that actually came on the Mayflower and artifacts of the English and Wampanoag families that lived in Plymouth Colony. The museum is open seven days a week with changing exhibits, daily activities for kids and families, free admission for residents of Plymouth and special programs through the year. Check out our new early architecture exhibit featuring a full-size timber-framed room to find out more, visit pilgrimhallmuseum.org.